Coming up on DTNS, the PS5 is finally profitable. Facebook bans researchers of political ads and an MIT study of the fastest improving technology. DTNS starts now. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, August 4th, 2021 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. In Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. And I'm Roger Chang, the show's producer. We were just discussing having Bluetooth in your tooth and bone conducting audio and all of the wonderful things that would happen from them and why Scott Johnson is worried about firmware updates. If you want that wider conversation, get our expanded show, Good Day Internet. Become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. That is where you can join our top patrons like Paul Thiessen, Ali Sanjabi, and Andrew Bradley. All right, let's start off with a few tech things you should know. NBC Universal's Fandango acquired the on-demand video streaming service Vudu from Walmart last year for $100 million. Now, Fandango will merge its Fandango Now streaming platform with Vudu, but it will keep the Vudu name going forward. This Vudu service will offer 200,000 new release and catalog TV and movie titles to rent or buy, as well as thousands of free-to-stream titles. Vudu will also take Fandango Now's place as the official movie store on the Roku platform. And my wife is an employee of Fandango and doesn't know anything about this. So don't ask her. According to a company message to Apple retail employees seen by Bloomberg, Apple will launch a buy now, pay later program along with a firm holdings in Canada. The program will debut later in August for online and in-store purchases available over 12 or 24 months. Microsoft paused its two-month free trial offers of its new Windows 365 cloud PC service, citing the need to boost server capacity to meet significant demand. Where have you heard this story before? Customers can sign up to be notified when free trials are available again, and all tiers of Windows 365 are still available for paid subscribers. WhatsApp rolled out view once messages, which automatically delete photos and videos after they are viewed and dismissed, you know, like Snapchat. Senders will see a message as opened in chat once it has been viewed by the recipient. The information sources say that WhatsApp owner Facebook is hiring AI researchers specializing in homomorphic encryption in the hopes of building the ability to analyze the content of encrypted data without having to decrypt it. Such an approach could open the door to eventually targeting ads based on encrypted messages. In a response to the report, Facebook told the information, it's too early for us to consider homomorphic encryption for WhatsApp at this time. But if you'd like to know more about that kind of encryption, check out the homomorphic encryption episode of Know A Little More at knowalittlemore.com. All right, let's talk about Sony. Let's do it. So Sony beat expectations with operating profit of $2.6 billion and a 9% increase in net income. The music se segment saw profits almost double with strengthening streaming and physical media sales. Operating income from Sony Pictures fell tw $20 million to $232 million with the lack of theatrical releases, lowering home entertainment revenue. And games split the difference with sales rising, but profits falling. Hardware and peripheral sales rose, but revenue from non-first-party games fell, and hardware was largely sold at a loss with the new PS5 dominating sales. However, that number should turn around as the $499 PlayStation 5 is no longer selling at a loss, that's according to Sony's CFO, and the $399 PS5 Digital Edition looks to have its losses offset not only by accessory sales, but also the PS4. Hmm. Sony sold 500,000 PS4 consoles last quarter. It's still selling well. Sony also said that there are 104 million monthly active users on the PlayStation Network, and, that's, uh, and they also spend an average of $37.09 per quarter each. It's a lot of money, turns out. Um, yeah, it's really good to hear. The one thing that surprises me the most about hearing the PlayStation 5 is out of the red. Um, the, first of all, it's not unusual. These consoles, especially from them and Microsoft, typically are sold as lost leaders for a while, and they make up uh, uh, the, the those profits on the back end, either with game sales or, more increasingly, subscription-type content like PlayStation Plus and uh, Xbox Game Pass and the like. Um, this is just sooner than I expected, mostly because it 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 seems a little odd when you compare it to the stories you guys have been talking about here on the show a lot about how Sony can't keep up with demand 
for this device. And what that normally tells me is that, yes, the pipeline is slowed. Yes, there's chip shortages. Yes, there's all those reasons. But a lot of times that means that stuff goes up in price because the demand is higher. So you're going to be paying more for those components. So I would have thought this would have taken longer for them to uh, to pull themselves out of the red. And by comparison, Microsoft is still selling uh, Series X models at a loss. Um, I kind of thought they'd both be doing that for at least the first year of this thing. So the fact that they've done that is is pretty uh, pretty impressive. Yeah, uh, w what that tells me, and this is just a guess, is that the components that make up the PS5, the majority of them are getting cheaper. It's it's only a few of them that are slowing down production. And maybe those are getting expensive, but not expensive enough. Uh, that that's what it sort of implies to me. Or uh, that that one of the one of the problems with production isn't making the parts; it's shipping them. And it's just it's just the slowdown in shipping lanes, like we talked uh, about with uh, Big Jim on on Saturday, uh, is is causing the the supply shortage uh, because you can't get the parts to the factory fast enough. Yeah, there's also whether whether people want to put a lot of stock in this or not. There was a lot of talk right before the price announcement of the PlayStation 5, uh, that they were scrambling in the wake of Microsoft coming out early with pricing and going, oh, that's about 50 to to $100 less than we were planning. So we got to decide what to do. Now, if those stories were true, that adds to even more reason why I thought this was going to take longer. Yeah. But none of that was really sussed out, so who knows. But the point is, uh, all of these companies want to get to a place where every time they sell a box, it's at a profit, and services and games just add to that profit. Yeah, they got there much quicker than usual, and I guess that's it's good. the it's the fastest selling thing you can't get. Yeah, <laughs> if if you're yeah, out there's there, so thinking, like, there's so much stuff about that math that I'm like, how? <laughs> right. Well, how'd you do it, reminder. Sony? If you're the person out there who's like, I can't even buy one. I want to buy one, but I can't. That's a good reminder that you are a single data point, and there are yeah. lots of people who did get them apparently. Yeah, good point. Scientists at MIT analyzed the U.S. patent system in an attempt to determine which technology is improving the fastest, which are improving the slowest, and which just have the most work being done on them, but maybe not improving all that fast. Uh, they used an algorithm with machine learning and natural language processing on patent network data and were able to measure something called centrality. Now, if you want to know how that all works, read the paper. But the central patents are essentially the hub of citation. So that means they refer to a lot of patents before themselves and are cited by a lot of patents that come after them. And that centrality is used to make predictions about how fast a category is improving. The more centralized patents you have, I think, the, the faster it's improving. They used a previously defined classification system to identify 1,757 categories, which in the paper they call domains, a domain of invention, uh, you know, like cryptocurrency or something like that. And that covered about 97% of patents. They found that the more work being done on a category does not necessarily lead to greater improvement. The fastest improving areas were mostly software-based, particularly internet and enterprise network management. And overall, they estimate that technology in general is improving about 19% per year. Mechanical skin treatment, hair removal, and wrinkles was one category, and that had the lowest rate of improvement at 1.9% a year. So if you're looking at your wrinkles, wondering why you still have them, that's why. But <laughs> dynamic information exchange and support systems, integrating multiple channels, another category, has been improving at a blistering 216% a year. All right, so, so what's fastest besides that? Top six fastest categories are all network-related including client server applications, messaging and advertising, addressing network, network addressing and access, enterprise security, enterprise access management, in that order. Spots seven through 10 are video delivery, CDNs, being able to deliver video, encryption, mixing encryption and unencrypted data, and data management for e-commerce. You can search the database yourself too. They, they put a link up at technologyrates.mit.edu. Ed, it will tell you the estimated improvement rate and the number of patents in the category. So you can do like just natural language stuff like cryptocurrency and it'll show you their domains that apply to that. Well, I think this stuff is so fascinating and uh, seems like the kind of stuff you should expect out of somebody like MIT. But here's, here's my big, uh, biggest takeaway. That 216% increase in what they're calling dynamic information exchange and support systems, 
integrated across multiple channels. What that sounds like to me is my doctor or my dentist should never have their software go down again. That's what that tells me. Or at least we're getting to a place where it's so much better that those kinds of systems where they got to reach out, talk to the healthcare providers and other stuff and come have it all come back and pull up old data and have it all mesh together and work and be easy for an average human being to pull up and, and have. It seems like that's where the biggest gains are being made and not me looking any younger. So I'll take that. That's fine. <laughs> Yeah. It's fine. Well, I mean, speak for yourself, Scott. <laughs> uh, I I actually found the the idea of a central patent being uh, this was really eye opening for me because you hear all the time, oh, a company has been granted a patent or has applied for this patent. You think, okay, well, they're going to corner the market on all of this, and many patents are only part of all sorts of other technology that's being developed that also has its own patent but are related patent wise. And there may have been patents in the past and then yours and then patents in the future. And it's all part of a certain category that then you look at collectively and say, oh, there's some movement going on in this aspect of technology. Yeah, I'm, I'm having fun just looking through this uh, database and finding out like, okay, what, what are the things that are improving? I, I put in phones and it gave me five domains and the domains don't have natural language names, so I had to dig into them. But one that's improving like 112% per year includes packet routing and switching, dynamically limiting output queue size, uh, providing loop-free routing tables, high-speed fiber channel switch element. This is all like super technical stuff, but it means that the networking aspect of things, which is borne out by the that top 10 I read, is the is where all of the advancements are being made. And man, that is heartening, right? Because when you think about the problems, a lot of the problems we have are with networking. It's it's with the network just not communicating fast or dropping packets or or things just not being smooth or not having enough bandwidth. And uh, it's it's good to know that you know folks aren't just sitting around waiting for that to get better. Like they are they are banging their heads against it and we're making progress. Hey, folks, would you like to make progress in your apparel? Uh, we have brand new DTNS stuff with the Daily Tech News Show album art logo. If you've seen the multicolored album art logo of Daily Tech News Show, you can now get a hat. Uh, you can get a hoodie. Uh, you can get all that kind of stuff with that new logo on it. Check it out at dailytechnewsshow.com slash store. All right, let's get to this Alibaba story. Alibaba Cloud posted a branded article on Tech in Asia detailing their partnership with the Olympics for digital content. If you've been, been watching a bunch of that online, probably getting it out of there. And while it's uh, all from Alibaba's perspective, the fact is Alibaba Cloud is the main partner for Olympic broadcasts this year and maybe moving forward. The Olympic Broadcasting Service, or OBS, all right, I don't know if that sounds familiar, don't get them confused, provides broadcasters from around the world with the official video of the competitions. That's why the shots of actual events look identical no matter where in the world you're viewing them, if anyone of you noticed that. Alibaba Cloud is OBS's partner uh, using a service called Content Plus to give broadcasters the ability to grab highlights, interviews, and post-produced content for use in reporting on the games. Alibaba Live Cloud is used for or by four broadcasters to submit in 4K video as well. Alibaba Content Plus makes live streams and short form ready to air content available. Alibaba Cloud is also providing 3D athlete tracking using standard video and computer vision algorithms to track 20 points in 3D. That's where these uh, visualizations you see during events are coming from. So that's what that's all about. The point being, cloud video is coming into its own in, in these games, specifically these Olympic games, and centralized by the IOC and hosted by Alibaba, which, as we mentioned on Tuesday here on the show, uh, is one of the Chinese companies with decent enough global revenue to balance the effect of China's domestic crackdown on tech companies. So are they uh, more immune than others? Are they like uh, ByteDance and uh, maybe a couple other examples where they're a little less, I don't know, held down by their own domestic policies? I mean, yeah, they're not not entirely dependent on the mainland, maybe? Uh, that's a really good question. I I think this is fascinating, and I think it's fascinating that Alibaba is out there planting articles in tech and Asia, and I saw them in other places as well, to say, hey, we're doing this. 
because they are. They they are providing the cloud system for Olympic broadcasting. Now, granted, NBC's doing a lot of stuff themselves because they're Comcast owned. And so they're able to just say, you know what, we'll just take the feed uh, directly from OBS and we'll stream it out. They may not be using Alibaba Cloud. I couldn't find confirmation about that. But enough are, in fact, four broadcasters even using it to, to transmit their own 4K video, uh, that this, this implies that Alibaba Cloud is reliable enough to provide service worldwide. Uh, and I think a lot of broadcasters that aren't even official Olympic broadcasters are using this to get the clips, right? To get the highlights to put on the news, et cetera. Uh, so I think this is really fascinating because it does imply that uh, Alibaba might be too big for China to affect as badly as they are some of the more domestic companies, yeah. at least platform companies. I, I do like, uh, there's something about consistency that I like about this. Um, I was reading through the article and I, my big takeaway was, the reason everybody's getting the same clips is because they're pulling from the same source. Right. And just my brain goes into kind of production mode. And I think to myself, well, if it were me, I would love this because that means I get to pick and choose from stuff that is, you know, on the ground there at the event, getting the shots I want. And I'm not going to be using something that somebody else doesn't either have access to, or they don't have access to something better than I do. Yeah. If right. There is something nice about that standardization. There are downsides to that, but um, that's one a point of contact that's really interesting here, but also just the fact that cloud in general, and I don't mean to make this sound like, you know, synergistic freaking computer word terminology, but the cloud is finally coming into this place where we were kind of promised it would go. And, 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 and even in places we didn't think about before and what it actually means and what the real world applications are. This is a really interesting one given that we're, you know, so also are sort of glued to the Olympics right now. So it's a uh, it's a really it's it's fun to see it get to this point. Yeah. Well, and, and, and also it's a reminder it's, too that it's oh, worldwide, ahead, right? It's it's not it's all I want to say is it's not just AWS and Google and Microsoft, right. Azure, right? right. Yeah. Good go point. ahead. Well, the what I was going to say is it's sort of like okay, sure, Elliot Public Cloud seems to be doing a pretty bang up job of this. Are there is there going to be backlash against the company for this or that that would affect something like this four years from now at the next Olympics? Maybe hard to say. Would that be Amazon Cloud giving us all Olympic highlights, uh, you know, in 4K video uh, that are easily digested, you know, on on variety of platforms? It's uh, it's Alibaba for now, and it is, you know, you mentioned NBC, Tom, and I, yeah, I always think of like NBC or NBC, a variety of on-demand uh, NBC-owned, you know, initiatives that I might be able to watch Olympics on. I have some options now, but. I it, it's interesting to know a little bit more about the back end that's actually providing everybody with this. Yeah, yeah. And I, I wonder if the IOC picks uh, Alibaba Cloud because it's not US based, because they're dealing with clients worldwide. And there is a tendency to think like, ah, those US companies, they they they're they're they tend to overreach. Uh, maybe they're too big. Uh, where Alibaba Cloud has the, you know, well, it's China, will my data be safe? But here, you're not storing data with them, you're getting data from them. Uh, right. So, so yeah, and I'm sure even NBC is using it to pull clips, pull highlights, because that Content Plus thing you mentioned, Scott, uh, provides clips in real time. So if you need to pull highlights as they're happening, if you've got the license for Content Plus, you can do that. So it does seem pretty impressive. I think it's interesting that, you know, we're, uh, what, five days away from the end of the Olympics, you know, week and a half in, and now is when Alibaba starts pushing these articles out. They wanted to make sure it worked, that they yeah. didn't melt down, uh, and it's, it sounds like it didn't. Yeah. Plus, people, just the idea of real-time anything. Like, it's like Getty Images, but get them while they're being taken, you know? Yeah, There's right. There's something really powerful about that. So. Well, here's a real powerful story that's tearing up the internet today. Researchers at NYU started the NYU Ad Observatory a little more than a year ago to study the spread of political ads on Facebook without having Facebook involved and or interfering in the process. A plugin called Ad Observer is voluntarily installed by users and collects data that Facebook provides to those users about why an ad was targeted to them, usually a list of interests. So if you've ever had an ad delivered by Facebook, you'll notice you can say, why am I getting this ad? And you can click it and it'll give you a list of reasons. This, this extension with your permission says, we just like to take those reasons. Anything that's in that little list that you would click, we'd just like to automatically get that data. 
Ad Observatory collected only that data to determine what interests were being targeted by political advertisers. Ad Observatory says its plugin does not collect identifying information. It does not collect your name, your Facebook ID, your friends list, just the data that's available when you would click that little button. Facebook does not offer the targeting info in that little window through its own ad library feature, which is another reason why Ad Observatory wanted to do this themselves. It does, Facebook does provide information on targeting through a special research program called Fort, but that information is filtered by Facebook. And NYU said, we want an independent, unfiltered information to look at. And in fact, they've found some discrepancies between what Facebook reports and what their uh, extensions have found. Facebook says, it tried for more than a year to convince NYU Ad Observatory to use Fort and that if it didn't, it would be in violation of Facebook's terms of service. Facebook claims that the plugin does collect usernames and that other information it collects is not publicly viewable and therefore scraping it is a violation of the terms of service. Facebook claimed the extension collected data about Facebook users who did not install the extension or consent to the collection. And that is true. Advertisers are users of Facebook and did not consent to the collection of their publicly available advertising information. And that little box you check is not publicly available. So technically, it is a violation of the terms of service. Facebook has now, and here's the news today, disabled the accounts, apps, pages, and platforms associated with the NYU's Ad Observatory project and its operators. So not just the project, but also the personal accounts of the people involved with the project. And that has caused the internet to blow up a little bit. Mm. Yeah, no kidding. I So it, this is a big story today and I, I've been following it the best I can. My, my first question is, why would Facebook have, why, why did the company say, yeah, sure, NYU ad observatory, you can go ahead and do this. We're okay with this. And then later say, well, hold on a second. They never You're did. not doing what? They never said they were okay with it. They, they're saying from the beginning, we want that you to they... do it within our program, Fort. Right. If you do the that, forts. we're okay with it. It's the fact that they didn't do it within the Facebook Fort program that got them upset. I mean, this sounds like Facebook probably... I don't know. I'm so torn on this. I mean, I don't Sarah, want more... are you saying what took them so long to finally like crack down? Kind of. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I, you know, it's, it, there's so much that I, you know, read from, you know, folks who uh, follow the story pretty closely saying, what were they thinking? Why, why, why did this get to this point? Facebook, no, Facebook understands, you know, who's scraping and how that sort of stuff works. And why is it now coming to a point where Facebook says, well, hold on a second. We told you to use Fort this entire time and you didn't. And now we're going to shut down a bunch of personal accounts of people involved in a research project that actually might be somewhat helpful. Yeah, I, I think Facebook would say, and they seem to be saying, we were we were trying to give them a chance to do it right. We didn't want to just slam down on them. In other words, they didn't want the bad press. Uh, but they finally got to their limit. Why now? I don't I don't know particularly why now and not earlier or later, right? Uh, the The question I have is, yes, Facebook uh, has a program where you can do this that they say protects privacy. I assume that means it protects the privacy of the advertisers because that really seems to be well, the only. Yeah. That, victim that of the seems privacy to be, here. That's right. the point of contention at this point, right? Facebook saying, well, hold on a second. We have some advertisers that aren't super happy with this. Yeah, and, and that is proprietary information where advertisers are like, well, wait a minute. We don't want our competitors to know all of this data about us. I, I get that. that. That's a fairly reasonable uh, thing to happen. On the other end, uh, I get why NYU is like, we don't really care about that. Uh, we're trying to collect pure data for our research. And the only way to do that is to not have Facebook interfering in the collection of the data on behalf of the advertisers. And there, there is a study where they found that the reporting was different than what they were finding in the extension. And that kind of proved that they're like, yeah, we do need an independent way of looking at this. My, my only add to this would be uh, having all these personal accounts get canned seems like a step too far. Like I, like all the way up to the point of, well, we've decided we don't want to do this anymore so we're going to disable your plugin and we're going to stop this from happening okay but then just go ahead and let's just kill all the accounts of everybody who had anything to do with the project 
that seems petty and weird. I but don't get that, that part. That's how they treat every violation of a term of service. And you might be singing a different tune if this was terrorists violating a term of service or something where right, you had no right. sympathy for it, right? You'd want yeah, them to be like, why did they leave their personal accounts up? That's a loophole. And they can, you know, like you've got to have one set of rules for everybody. Yeah. yeah that's dangerous, though, because one set of I rules know. is so letter of the law, you're going to have to apply it to, you know, mitigating circumstances and it's going to look bad. And that's where we're at. And that's where we're at. Yeah. Yep. I, I come down on the side of NYU. I get that Facebook has technically the right to do this. It, they, they did violate the terms of service. Uh, but if, if it's me, I'm saying, Facebook, you need to come up with a way to accommodate the NYU Ad Observatory project. And I know that's an uncomfortable conversation for you to have with your advertisers. Uh, but the, yep. I think NYU Ad Observatory project has an ethical, uh, an ethical argument on their side here. Yeah, I agree. Well, uh, for years now, we've been talking about meat alternatives uh, beyond beyond meat. Impossible Burger, for example, mm -hmm. kind of red meat stuff. But folks, plant-based foods are now coming for fish. What? If you don't want to eat fish, but you want to pretend you're eating fish, <laughs> you're in luck because Madrid-based tomato is using a specially grown tomato. You might say tomato if you're... I don't know, but <laughs> also call it. call it tomato, 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 along with algae and spices to create faux tuna. They're not the only company doing this, though. Francis Otanella sells plant-based smoked salmon that's actually made from algae and pea protein, which is funny because that's my favorite milk, also made from pea protein. <laughs> pea is the best. Pea is the you absolute can do everything. best. It really can. Uh, I am so into this. Listen, I, I'm a fish eater. I I. I, I like fish. I, I think it tastes good. I also know that there are a lot of uh, nutritional components to fish, omega-3s, you know, do, you know. Th there's a long list. Uh, but you also have to think about where your fish is sourced from, uh, you know, if it's farmed versus wild, uh, if it's overfished. And anything that could get me to a point where I could have, I don't know, my filet of sole that is plant-based and therefore making less of a negative impact on the environment. I am all for it. Yeah. I was, I was at first, I was like, no, but you want real fish. I, because I am a person who believes in eating real food, not processed food. And essentially these, these meat replacements are processed food. Processed foods, uh, yeah. And I'm like, you're not going to get all the nutrients if you're just eating a tomato that tastes like tuna, no matter how much like tuna it tastes, but the companies do make an effort. That's why they include algae to, replicate the nutrient profile so that you're getting omega-3s, you're getting all those nutrients uh, that are in fish, at which point then it does go back to the like, well, okay, if salmon are being overfished and that's detrimental to the environment, then I suppose eating a an Odentella pea protein smoked salmon every once in a while, if I'm getting the same nutrition, maybe that's not so bad. I don't know. Yeah, I'd eat it. I'm ready. I like this artificial stuff. My my um, Tom made me think a little harder though or more about well, what's actually in there? This isn't just about replicating the experience. Like, can I actually get out of it what you're supposed to get out of it? And if they can do that in a way that's like, I don't know, provable, I'm I'm way more for that. Um, yeah. Because I do like me some fish. And you know what? If I can make a, if I can have fish that's consistently like not too fishy or just kind of perfect fish, that but gets it's you all the nutrients. <laughs> yeah, it gives me all those nutrients. So that'd that's be great. More of like a taste thing. Yeah. You know, yeah. Some, sometimes you're you're you know it's Russian roulette with these fish, and I, <laughs> this seems like a way to make it a little more consistent. A biocow so. in our chat room is saying, "Will my coworkers get mad if I microwave?" Oh, <laughs> maybe you know, that's that, the that that's the real question, right? Is Tunado going to be able to make fish that doesn't stink when you microwave, microwave it the next a day? and no yep. one will complain. That would be a, that would be a great. It's marketing. made of pea protein. You're good. Also, I can't wait I for McDonald's filet of fish. Mm. Here you go. Yep. All right. With with that, we should probably move on to the mailbag. <laughs> this, this one comes from Ian. This is actually a question that Ian had uh, related to uh, a saying that we had some updated Waze voices, meaning our voices that you can actually uh, um, install on Waze if you would like us to give you directions. Ian says, I drive home listening to DTNS and I have DTNS interrupt DTNS to give me traffic 
traffic updates. How meta? Where can you get the updated Ways voices? Ah, yes. Uh, so Paolo, uh, thank you, Paolo, is the one who has made these. Uh, there is a a couple of DTNS sets. There's also a Roger Chang one, a Sarah Lane one, and a Sarah Lane funny one. Uh, a, a me one and a Shannon Morse and a Shannon Morse funny one as well. And you can find the link to all of them at dailytechnewsshow.com slash picks right there at the top of the page. Excellent. If you have feedback, if you have questions, if you have comments, anything that we talk about on the show or might talk about on a future show, please do send it our way. We love your feedback. You help make our show what it is. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Also, we would like to thank a couple of new bosses. In yes. fact, three of them. We got Igor Ackerman, we got Dennis Horton, and we got Christy Beck. All just started backing us on Patreon. So thank you, Igor. Thank you, Dennis. And thank you, Christy. Yes, you made our day, all three of you. Uh, every time we get a, a new boss on Patreon, one of us gets wings, I think. <laughs> Have you gotten yours yet? Yeah, yeah. I mean, which one? We're I, know, I guess, wings. yeah, you only get one at a time, so you got to fly careful when you got the one wing. <laughs> Make also, us more angel, angels and wings? I'm like, what's happening? <laughs> okay. The red <laughs> dragon. Wait, that's him. <laughs> Not good. Uh, also, thanks to you, Scott Johnson. I, I don't know if you have your wings or not, but we love you either way. Uh, you probably have made some illustration at some point of yourself with wings. Sure. Uh, but sure. what else is going on in your world? Right. I just have two bloody stumps right now. Um, I'll work on them. <laughs> Uh, lots going on. Always something happening over at frogpants.com. So if you're looking for a whole bunch of insight into these recent problems they've been having at Blizzard Entertainment, I've got shows about that. If you're looking for good old-fashioned video game content, I've got that. If you're looking for comics, illustration, other stuff, it's all there. So I would just point you all to frogpants.com where you'll find all of it. That's frogpants.com. And find me on Twitter. I'm at Scott Johnson. Excellent. We are live on this show Monday through Friday, every weekday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 2030 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. And we will be back here doing it all again tomorrow with Justin Robert Young. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. You have enjoyed this broker. <laughs>